Hi everyone, um, I'm Chris Whitaker, and um, I'm the author of We Begin at the End. Um, I'm going to be talking to you, uh, Lucy Foley tonight, the brilliant, amazing author and bestseller, Sunday Times bestseller of the guest list. Um, while I'm waiting for her to join me, I'm um, going to take this time to plug my own book. I'm just connecting to Lucy now. Hey, how are you? Great. Plug, plug the book, plug the book. <laughs> plug the book. No, so um, Walter, I don't have Instagram, so Waterstones have bravely let me take control of their Instagram account, um, as long as I promise not to plug my book. I'm just going to leave that there for the whole of the interview. Um, <laughs> no, so I have to switch off the comments, apparently, in case people are mean to us. Oh, Isn't that no. sad? Don't be <laughs> <laughs> Right, I've, turned it, I've turned it off for now, but I'm going to turn it back on again at the end. But um, I can't believe anyone would be mean to us. No. Isn't it sad? What a sorry world we live in. <laughs> we, were, um, we were comparing, well, we were talking about kind of Instagram live disasters earlier, weren't we? I was, I was running you through all of mine. <laughs> and, and, uh, the the uh, Reese Witherspoon one was my favourite, my absolute favourite. That was, yeah, so I'm going to shame him on here. That was my husband ordering his delivery quite audibly in the background. Um, in French as well. In, in really bad French, because we're in Brussels. <laughs> oh. uh, so you're heavily pregnant? Like, super pregnant. Um, okay. Nine weeks today. Going to try very hard not to go into labour. Okay. <laughs> that would make this memorable. Would be a first. It might be an Instagram first, you know. Good. <laughs> Never know. Um, so we're going to talk today about the guest list. I'm going to stay, try and stay coherent because my day began at 4am because we were talking about babies. I've got a 10 week old and um, you were talking about, you know, tips and things like that. And I'm not qualified, but the, one, th the one thing I've learned is um, don't look into the cots at night ever because I, I heard some, so I heard some noise at about four o'clock in the morning. So I looked into the cot and then she sees my face and she goes oh, like that. And she's like, Daddy's awake, it's four AM, let's get up and play. Party time. And then, yeah. So now yeah, exhausted. Okay. <laughs> right, so so my job tonight is to talk to you about your amazing book, The Guest List. Um I read it a while ago and um, was blown away and I reread it today. I was working at the library today. I work part time at the library. It's been really quiet, so I read the whole book again, and it was just as good the second time round. Wow, Chris! So you you got up at four, you've worked in the library, and you've read a book, whole book today. I'm yeah, that is multitasking. <laughs> I've done no writing of my own though, and I'm massively behind. So I'm going to take this opportunity to ask for an extension on my deadline because nice. my editor's watching. Nice. Yeah, she <laughs> can't say no. Right, so can you tell us a bit about the guest list? Yeah, sure. So the guest list is set on an island off the west coast of Ireland, which is quite, quite a tongue, tw tongue twister. Um, and it's set at this uh, wedding. So it's a wedding of Jules and Will, this sort of glamorous golden couple. And it should be the perfect weekend. Um, they've invited all their nearest and dearest to celebrate with them. Um, unfortunately, some of their guests have other ideas and have brought with them buried secrets and resentments. And so really the tension starts to build from the rehearsal dinner the night before the wedding kind of onwards through the wedding day as this sort of storm approaches from the Atlantic um, to the extent just after the wedding cake has been cut a broken body is found in the darkness beyond the wedding tent who done it there we go but, um, that was really good that was really slick how many times have you done that um oh I don't know it changes every time and then I cut and then I'm like oh god no I've said something wrong but um that but was perfect you have to get used to kind of talking about your book, don't you? Which I think is really actually really hard for any author, weirdly. Yeah, because I can never make it sound good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like you write this massive book and you spend so long writing it and then you have to condense it down to a paragraph. Totally. And it's, yeah, it just it's, doesn't work. Because you want to get everything in there. You basically want to tell people the whole synopsis of the book. Which We which... do. And I think it's such a skill, you know, when they write the blurb for the back. And they send it to me and I'm, I'm allowed to change it and stuff, but I never have to because they're so good at it. And I'm like in awe of them. And also condensing it into the cover, I'm just going to hold this up, but like condensing, you know, the whole book into one, one image is, is also really difficult, I think. Yeah, um, it's a real skill. So I'm going to give you some numbers now. 
some numbers that I've got. So the hardback, first of all, Sunday Times number two bestseller, nine weeks in the top 10. Irish number one bestseller, 24 weeks in the top 10. 10 weeks in the New York Times bestseller list. Am I embarrassing you? Yeah. <laughs> Feeling really British. <laughs> okay. um, 185,000 copies sold. This has probably gone up massively recently as well. Um, Reese's Book Club pick. That's Reese Witherspoon, the Hollywood megastar. And um, as for the paperback, um, I know this weekend you're going to be number one yeah. in the Sunday Times. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think um, there's such a thing as too much success, Lucy? Oh, I don't know. I'm feeling very lucky right now. Um... I don't know, it's uh, no pressure on the next book. Yeah, that's what I mean. Does it really kind of... Mind you, that The Hunting Party was a massive hit as well. So do you, did it change you um, know, the expectation? No, I mean, to be honest, I'd... Um, because I don't know about you, but I'm on really short deadlines. So I'd actually had to... I'd written most of the guest list by the time The Hunting Party came out. So I was just mainly worrying about, like, edits at the point when it came out. So I, th I think it's quite healthy to always be, like, just worrying about the next book, to be honest. Um, yeah. Uh, they never get that much time between them. Um, they kind of give up asking me, though, because I just miss deadlines all the time. I, who, who was it that said, I love the sound of deadlines? Yeah, deadline. <laughs> I, I've, I've totally misquoted, but I think that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so are you going to have a break, presumably, for the next yeah. few months, at least? Bit of a bit of a break. Um, maternity leave. Um, I've written most of the third book, actually. I mean, it's kind of like third draft stage so maybe tinker on that if I can I, I'm sure there are lots of parents watching this being like so naive so um so we'll see I'm not putting too much pressure on myself no you do get like there's a, there's a period between 3 a.m and 6 where you get some good quality free time so <laughs> yeah I use it to work but I'm also thinking like really good time to watch box sets as well and catch up so yeah but um, we ended up putting on like there's a channel called Baby TV and it's um, the, the music just does your head in and that used to play yeah all night long and that's horrific sounds like a sort of twister. <laughs> it is it's really bad um, I'm gonna ask you quickly so the characters in the guest list if you had to date one of them which one would it be Jesus I know I know well I mean, oh, I would say one thing about the guests is they're not necessarily the most likable bunch. I love writing characters that you kind of love to hate or hate to love. Um, so, a really difficult question. Probably Hannah, because she's like <laughs> insane among them, I think. So, so Hannah is, in a way, she's, she's like the plus one. So, she's sort of... Yeah, I loved Hannah. Yeah, oh, good, good. Because I really enjoyed writing her and I sort of felt for her. And she's kind of the outsider. She's like she's like the kind of reader's eyes and ears into the story in a way. Um, uh, yeah, because there's a bit where she's, um, um, Charlie has left her for a while and she's kind of looking for a group to join. And I just, you know, that feeling when you're at a wedding and you don't really know anyone and you have to talk to people and they don't it, want you there because they're in their own group. It's horrible, isn't it? And it I is get that feeling across of when exactly that when you don't know many people at a wedding and actually or everyone else there seems to know each other and really they're, they're seeing it as an opportunity to catch up with like really old friends they haven't seen for ages and you sort of have to like insert yourself into a group like just try and not back the drinks I think that's the only way which is kind of what she does she does yeah she <laughs> does um so it's the characters are amazing and it's told from multiple viewpoints um i know firsthand how difficult that is um i did that in my first book tall oaks i'm really going for it with the plugs aren't i oh, it's that's the last one i'm not going to do it again <laughs> so um how do you keep them straight how do you make sure the voices are distinct so difficult isn't it i mean it's really hard um but i don't know in a way like i i kind of I love being able to write in different voices because I can sort of <laughs> wake up feeling like I want to write from Jono's perspective or from Hannah's perspective. So I can sort of pick and choose like that. Um, I think the thing is the voices are always really clear in my own head. Um, so I have a really clear idea of who they are in my own head and how they sound and the way they talk. But it's always that kind of discrepancy between what have you got in your head as an author and what have you actually put on the page, isn't it? So it's like, it's, it's how do you make sure that comes across? So I think... It's really a sort of question of layering and, and, and through the different drafts that you do of the book and making sure that, you know, even little turns of phrase aren't kind of the same across 
certain characters because otherwise your your voice as the author is coming in too much that it's sort of too heavy um so that's always one of the challenges but i think also the joys of doing it have, have you found the same writing from different perspectives yeah yeah it was um yeah i kind of i got to the end of the story and then i split every character up and put them in their own document and tried to go through it like that then put it back together and i got in a real mess with it no but that's I did so you almost had like, and then like the narrative flow of each yeah character. I was making sure yeah yeah but I don't know how much it helped and because it just because there was just a jumble across all the screens it was like oh yeah and then I had to rebuild it and I, I didn't save an earlier draft and then this was my first book so I didn't know what I was doing and no it was like a jigsaw that I couldn't put back together again oh yeah. God. I know really stressful <laughs> That, that actually makes me, because I am the worst at backing up my work. That is like... Yeah, me too. And I see sometimes authors tweet it, don't they, or something, that they've lost like 2,000 words or something. And I'll, I'll have, it hasn't happened to me yet, but I'd be so upset. But you know that now we've said it, it will happen. It, it will, will happen. And it will be the best 2,000 words we've ever written. Hideous. <laughs> 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 Know. Do you find that you um, you enjoy writing certain characters more than others and you kind of look forward to that bit? you know when, when you're going to work on them I guess there are certain characters that have you know they're the more distinct for me earlier on so you know perhaps I've got to know who they are that sounds really sort of pretentious but you know I feel a, a kind of more vivid sense of them earlier in the writing process and then other characters come to you later so I sort of yeah I guess start off with those characters that I feel I know the most kind of clearly um it's the same with scenes to be honest I don't write chronologically I'll write um you know the scenes that I see most vividly and often those are like the kind of group scenes of everyone coming together which is why it's so much fun to set a book at a party at, at a wedding or a party because you can have those sort of great group kind of um set pieces which I enjoy sort of starting with and kind of then feeling my way into the more individual scenes yeah I know exactly what you mean I do the same sort of thing I write completely out of order and um I don't write the first chapter because there's so much pressure isn't there on the oh. first opening paragraph it's like the first page of a new notebook at school. It's like, yeah. you just, uh, it has to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. It does. Um, so let's talk about the setting, the island. Um, it's an incredible part of the story. Um, why did you choose to set it there? And you have a connection, don't you, to the, to the island? Yeah, so um, family connection. So basically half my family come from Connemara, which is, uh, as well, the, the island is just off Connemara, um, which <laughs> beautiful part um of, of Ireland to sort the of west coast um and I think one of my first memories of it actually is going to a wedding there of a cousin um when I was about three but it's obviously not based on that no one died um it was a lovely occasion um but I've always sort of been fascinated by it um as an area it's so beautiful and yet at the same time very rugged and the island particular I'd never actually um traveled out to the islands before but uh the year before I started writing the guest list we we took a boat out to uh Inish Boffin which is one of the islands and it just really struck me that there was this sort of it was sort of so on exactly the sort of place you might want to set a wedding but at the same time it could become that environment could become quite hostile quite quickly you know the the, the crossing um from the mainland can get very choppy and some boats just can't come so you would be stranded you've got this sort of um constant wind blowing off the Atlantic um you've got kind of ruined houses that people used to live in that are now sort of um bare and so you've got you've almost got the kind of wind whistling through the stones it's very atmospheric um and I just thought this is the perfect sort of tension between kind of beauty and, and hostility like nature red and tooth and claw as it were Okay, so has that happened with the with the next book? You know, have you if you how did, how did you find the setting? Did you find it like in that way? Yeah, well, similar actually. So I was I was so it's a completely different setting. It's set in an old apartment block in Paris. Um, so it's set in the middle of a city, but at the same time, it's kind of isolated. It's sort of on its own. Um, and it was when I was actually trying to finish a draft of the guest list I booked myself like a an Airbnb in an apartment in this in this building in Paris and it was it was a kind of weird spooky old apartment building um and first thing every morning and last thing at night I would hear something really heavy like furniture being dragged across the floor upstairs um 
And of course, the murder mystery writer in me thought, yeah. oh, "Someone's hiding a body. There's something. It's you know, kind of Edgar Allan Poe stuff. There's something really dodgy going on up there." Um, and just little things like you know the the kind of stairwell and sort of going up in the the, the in, in sort of every apartment building in Paris. I feel like they have like these lights on a timer, so yeah. that kind of halfway up the stairs and then it'll go out and you'll be plunged into darkness. Um, so there were sort of wonderful kind of atmospheric things that I, I could use like that. So I've had a lot of fun with that. But I was going to say, I love um, We Begin at the End. The setting for me is like a character in the novel. Did you, was that something you were really conscious of from? Yeah, kind of. It started, uh, I wasn't going to do that. I was going to write like a really simple story. I pitched this like revenge story and I was going to write it in a year and then I got going with it and it kind of just evolved and became this massive, it's it's a really big book and um and it's California and Montana and I haven't been to either place. So hey, yeah. I, I, I'm absolutely bowled over by that because it's got such a strong it's that Jane Harper esque, like really strong sense of place for me. Yeah, so it's like yeah, I kind of build the scene so I'll I'll know roughly where it's gonna happen, the the scene in the book, and then I'll work across three screens and I'll kind of find images that look similar and I might have music playing that they might have music playing. And I kind of build the whole thing before I write anything. Wow. And I do that for each scene and yeah, and then I go and kind of cross check it with books from the libraries and maps and things like that. So yeah. That's brilliant. So that your study must look like your your working space just must look so satisfying with like Yeah, it gives me a headache. It really does. Yeah, I used to have a wall. We've moved house recently and we're having like massive building work done, which is fun with a newborn baby. Yeah. And um and I used to have a wall that I could write on and you know, map everything out and it really helps. I'm gonna do that soon, but I haven't had that luxury for the book I'm writing at the moment and it's been tougher. It has been really tough to keep track of everything, the notes and things like that. I imagine it almost like a kind of police investigation with like maps and pictures and you know yeah. and films like with them, all your inspiration. Yeah, up. and that, but then I end up making most of it up. You know, like I'll, I'll create a fictional town and just shove it somewhere <laughs> just because I can't get it right and it will drive me mad. And it's... But I think there's a real. I think I think as a writer, there's a real kind of artistic license in that. Like I wanted the island and the guest list to very much be based on places I did so you know Inish Boffin and the other islands but I knew that it had to be a fictional island um because I wanted to be able to kind of play with the geography of it and I and mm -hmm. and you know I, yeah I wanted that freedom really I think it's it's sort of it's important yeah I always feel like you know the Truman Show you know that dude that controls everything yeah yeah, <laughs> like that. yeah the puppet master yeah totally yeah. maybe that's us then maybe we're like megalomaniacs something like yeah. that. although I'm, I'm not very in control of any of the rest of my life i'm very yeah, no. my like one little thing that i can control <laughs> yeah maybe it's like therapy maybe that's yeah. how we cope <laughs> totally <laughs> so um i'm going to ask you about how you go about plotting and if you do plot or if you just start writing and do you know the ending in advance so I am like by nature um a total pantser there's this thing plotter or pantser do you write yeah. this that's obviously um and I'm by nature a total pantser like I when I wrote the three historicals that I wrote before the hunting party I would sort of have an idea of where I was starting an idea of where I'd end and I'd just go on a nice journey in between um, but with the hunting party and the guest list because one of the things that I find as a reader so satisfying about that kind of murder mystery format is is the puzzle format you know and it, it all kind of has to be everything has to be in the right place and as the reader you want to be able to go back at the end and sort of see where all the clues were and, and that you could fold it, you know, if you'd, if you'd spotted them. So I knew it was really important to just make myself plot um, really kind of carefully at the beginning. Um, so I did that with both books, but that said, um, as soon as I started writing, things started changing and characters' motivations started changing and I had different ideas for backstories that I felt were better than what I'd planned. and. And actually, with the guest list, the murderer changed about a third of the way through. Wow. <laughs> so, That's a massive change. It was a massive change. It was, re it was really exciting, I think, as a, as a writer, because, well, first of all, I thought, you know, if I haven't guessed, then hopefully it will be more difficult for the reader to guess. Um, but it, it was one of those real kind of goosebump moments of this works so much better and it makes much more sense of sort of some of the backstories that I've um, established here. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah, I know how it's going to end, and I, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I yeah, I do you do you plot? How, how carefully no, do you No, no, I just, I'll start 
with a scene that I've got in my head that could be from the middle of the book and um, I won't know the characters or anything and it will go through so many changes. I mean, how different is your is the finished book to the first draft? Oh, I mean, embarrassingly different. Yeah, same. And you used to be an editor. I wanted to ask you, what's it like being edited? Does that make you easier to edit or harder to edit? Or... It's What I've learned is it's. I, I thought it would help me edit my own books. It's very much not the case. I think as the writer, you're just too close to the, to the work. You know, it, yeah. you can't see the wood for the trees. But it has given me... I think, and it, it did give me an appreciation of the importance of having a really good editor and that editing process. Um, because much as I love the sort of first draft and like the innocence of that and just kind of getting everything down, the, 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 the point at which the book is made for me is in that dialogue, you know, that editing process. And my, my editor's really, she's brilliant. She like really hauls me over the coals um, and really makes me do the work like painful and it's hard but it's so important you sometimes get a nice comment in the margins yeah no but I love that don't that's you the one thing as an editor a former editor I know that you get your kind of for for me like 30 pages of editorial notes right. and I know there's like always a lovely paragraph at the beginning which is like oh this is the wonderful things about your book but I just skip it because I'm like that's really? just that's just softening me up you know I know yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go to like the mean stuff. Um, no, I like it in the actual copy edit. You know, when you've got all the margin notes, when you're going through the manuscript and, and it just reads like a whole list of things that you've absolutely messed up. And then all of a sudden they'll say something like, I love this line. And I'll be like, oh, oh I love you. Yeah. Or you get like a smiley face. It's like, yeah, the smiley face. It means so much. It's yeah. like being back at school, isn't it? It yeah. really is. <laughs> Sticker. Okay, so weddings. Are you going to approach with caution? I love a wedding, but I, I, I yeah, you ruined it a bit for me now. I'm sorry <laughs> for myself. And possibly I'm never going to get invited to anyone's wedding ever again. Um, no, I'm be a notebook. About this. Uh, I, it, you know, I, as someone in their kind of early 30s, I think I've just been to a lot of weddings in the last few years. And they've all been amazing, lovely, romantic, non-murderous occasions. But it did just occur to me, you know, you've got all these people gather together in one place, you've got kind of family members, you've got old friends, new friends. Um, so you've got this wonderful like potential <laughs> pressure cooker situation um, when you've also got sort of emotions running high and like expectations running high, all of that. So it just, it just seemed too perfect the setting for a murder mystery not to, not to explore. It really but does I love work so well. I love like the messiness of it. I love like that bit on the dance floor. That's that's my favourite bit of a wedding where everyone's yeah. pissed, you know, everyone's been drinking all day. Um, yeah. Really messy. And I really wanted to get that across um, for, yeah. for the murder mystery format. Yeah, so um, speaking of messy, your launch party, I had <laughs> one of the worst hangovers. <laughs> and I was talking to Lisa from Heat um, and she died the next day. <laughs> she was so bad. Yeah, it was just really, it was such a good night, but I just... That is, that is I mean, I'm really flattered. That is like a, a sign of a great launch party. So I'm so, and that was like just pre-COVID, wasn't it? Was, I think it was, yeah, like my last proper night out. And I needed all this time to recover. <laughs> yeah, it was that bad. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I, I remember thinking, I woke up in the morning and I remember thinking I shouldn't feel this bad. And that's when I started to realise that I'm getting old and it was a really sad day. No, what's really boring is I was pregnant at the time. I was already pregnant, so I couldn't drink. It was so boring. So I had to yeah, I... <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> glad we'll you know. Yeah, we'll make up for it, all this lost time, because I had to cancel my launch party, and I was devastated. Uh, yeah, it's really sad. Like, it's just, yeah, the, the, the sort of alternative reality of all the fun things that have happened this year, you know, yeah. this, that did happen in some universe, I think. Yeah. How has it been? How has your lockdown been? You know, have, have you struggled to work? It's, it's so, I think it's been, yeah, because you'd think, oh, I should get so much done. And like, this is sort of perfect. You know, I'm kind of stuck at home with nothing else to do. Um, but I found it quite hard creatively, I think. Um, uh, one of the things I love doing as a writer, like my kind of favourite place to write is going out to a coffee shop and writing in a coffee shop with all the noise and all the people watching. And yeah. that's not been possible um for, for a lot of the sort of covid experience um and i think also you know writing a book that's sort of set in 
the normal world with people kind of going into crowded bars and like crowded streets and all that 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 felt very weird sort of March April when I was sort of really writing the first draft um yeah it's and, strange isn't it yeah yeah it's been like there's loads of noise and you can't kind of shut it out to come to yeah work. that's what I found I think the other thing, the world, so whilst you're sort of isolated, the world is pressing in and like all the news and, and that's quite hard to shut out. Um, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, I, I've just spent kind of months, well, because we've had the baby, I've, I was thinking maybe it's, you know, because I can't concentrate because she's noisy and things like that. But I try writing even when it's quiet and I found it really hard. Uh, yeah. yeah. You just that's can't. too quiet when you're writing, I think. You, you almost... Yeah when it's too quiet I find it feels too much like work and I feel like I'm sort of you know every word is very important and I prefer just having a bit of noise and just kind of getting words down on the page and, and yeah, I've never written a word anywhere other than at my desk really? I just can't do it yeah I've tried loads of times like working in the library I try sitting there and I think I'll get some writing done and I just, just easily distracted. I'll see like a plane go by or something <laughs> and that'd be it. And once there was a squirrel outside my office and then um, I watched it for so long. It was like a whole morning. Yeah, any excuse. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's this hard, isn't it? This could go in a book one day, so I'm just going to see what happens. <laughs> so so um, we share an agent, the brilliant Kath Summerhays, and yes. um, everyone... Well, all aspiring writers love to know, how did you get your agent? That story. So how did you get Kath? Or how did Kath get you? Well, so one of the things, so I was working as an editor at the time when I wrote my first book. And one of the things I was really keen on was actually not sending the book out to anyone that I worked with professionally. Um, because okay. I just, but it feels like a very small world. I think I was just worried about the mortification if it was just awful. <laughs> You know and how I'd hold my head up so I'd sort of admired Kath from afar as like a, a brilliant agent that I would love to work with um, and I kind of knew her taste um, I think that's a really important thing when you're choosing an agent is to know what they're looking for their taste maybe find other authors that are writing in a kind of similar area to you on their list or, or perhaps they've even put out something saying I'm looking for this sort of book. Um, uh, so, so that was something I sort of did my research beforehand. Um, so I sent it to her. I just sort of sent it, yeah, via, via the normal channels. Um, and actually I called up. I probably shouldn't give this bit of advice because probably it's really annoying for agents. Yeah, they don't like it. I actually called up the agency and I was like, just want to check that you've got my manuscript and things. So I was quite keen. Um, but um, but no, it's just been a wonderful relationship. And I think that relationship is so important as well with your agent. You know, someone you really trust, someone that you can have kind of difficult conversations with so that you can keep things really nice with the publisher. <laughs> so that, yeah. that, that yeah. was very sweet. But they are able to have the difficult conversations without, um, you know, pissing everyone off, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's eight o'clock already. So I'm gonna. We've wow. got some. Yeah, I know. We've got some questions from people that have been on Waterstones. I guess I still don't know how Instagram works. You know, <laughs> if I switch the comments back on, if people have been mean, all the mean comments just fly across the screen. Is that how it works? See them. I want to see. Them. <laughs> I want to see them. <laughs> how could people be mean to a pregnant Lucy Bowley? I don't believe it. Yeah. They might just be talking about how sweaty I look, you know. <laughs> oh, how pale I look. Look how pale I am. It's the lighting. I'm not this pale. I've got like a Cullen look. <laughs> which, is, which is a good thing. I think you look great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I need some sleep. I think that's what it is. I really need some sleep. Right, so. Okay. Let's have a look. ch ch, -ch chels That wasn't me stuttering. That's what it says. Advice for writing a thriller novel. Right. Oh, wow. Okay, so... Or just advice for writing, I think. Advice for writing. So I would say the thing that I've always tried to do as a writer is just to write the book. I, I guess because I came to it from re uh, reading and loving books, um, is to try and write the book that I want to read. Um, so that as an editor, perhaps I would be really excited to turn up on my desk. Um, and that seems to work because I think if you're excited to kind of read it yourself then there'll hopefully be other people out there who would want to read it too that would be my first thing and then my second thing I think would be um uh read really widely um you know 
know your genre. Um, and a very specific thing, read Plotting and Writing Suspense Fiction by Patricia Highsmith. Um, I just think it's the most brilliant, it's the most brilliant kind of guide for writing in general, but also particularly kind of writing thrillers, I think. What, is, what are your tips? Um, mine's a really obvious one, but it's to enjoy it. And I think I forget that sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you kind of, you forget why you did it in the first place and then why you're so stressed about it. It's because you care so much. But, you know, I can't remember who told me. Someone said to me, if you're not um, enjoying it, you're doing something wrong. Totally. And um, yeah, and yeah, maybe that's the style you're writing in or the book you're writing, or you're just having a bad day and you should stop for the day. But yeah, just it's really important, isn't it, to enjoy it? Because it's such a brilliant job, you know, we get to create stories and entertain people. And um, I lose sight of that sometimes, I think. Yeah, and there are definitely stages in the editing process where it's just like, this is hard. And I can't, you know, when you're problem solving, which can be really satisfying. When you come up with a solution, it's so satisfying. But when you can't, you know, you've been trying to work out the solution for several days and it's just not coming. You're thinking, I literally wish I could do anything else that would take my mind off this for a while. Yeah, and it does, it feels like the biggest weight on my shoulders sometimes. Yeah. Like it'll ruin my mood and I'll be like, oh, I just can't, you know, and you just can't think clearly. And it really, yeah. it gets so difficult doesn't it? it really gets on top of you do you find that you often it's when you actually step away and like do something like have a shower or like go yeah. for, or cook a meal that actually that's when the solution comes to you because that's yeah. what I, yeah and then annoyingly it's when i get into bed at night <laughs> so but, i just yeah i but, just all of a sudden my brain switches on i to write things down i do and I, but i do it on my phone and that's like a no-no isn't it because you know that the blue light or whatever it is and yeah. um yeah but you, you've got the baby coming, so you don't need to worry about being kept away. Oh, by no, it's fine. <laughs> You'll be fine. Um, Sam Sam one one eight says, Lucy, if you could read a book again for the first time, what book would it be and why? Oh gosh, what an amazing question and so difficult. And when I really, really want to think about, um, wow. You want to come back to it? Deep, yeah, I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna mull it over. Oh no, actually, do you know, I thought of it, I thought of it. It's not really a thrill. I mean, there are so many thrillers that I would love to kind of come back to the first time. I, actually, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, if I'm gonna think of a kind of murder mystery, because it's just so cleverly done, that book. Um, and once you've lost your innocence, you've lost your innocence. But, um, you know, I'd love to kind of, yeah, read as a sort of innocent reader again. Um, but also, um, John Fowles, The Magus, um, yeah. I think is just one of the most clever, brilliant books I've ever read. And it just stayed with me. It's it stayed with me since I read it, really. And, and it has just such atmosphere. Um, and I love that experience again, really, of reading it. Yeah, I quite like a reread, though. Do you? Yeah. You know, I really enjoy it. Like when a book reads differently every time you read it. Me too. And I think as a writer as well, it's often like trying to figure out how they've done it. You know, it's like trying to kind of pull it apart and see the nuts and bolts and admire yeah. the craft. Okay, so Faye Powell says, um, you, do you always know how the book will end when you begin writing it? I think we kind of covered that, didn't we? We have a rough idea of how it will end and that can change. And it can change, which can be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I find it hard sometimes. You know, when you say you're going to kill someone at the end and then you spend the whole book writing them and getting to know them and really love them <laughs> and then you have to kill them and I feel that kind of pull sometimes you know to change it oh absolutely and it's also that thing of, of certain characters just they're meant to be like peripheral and then they just demand more and more screen time and you just kind of have such fun you end up just writing them sort of bigger and bigger parts but um that's part of the fun of it yes okay so um Lion's Strongest Aesthetics, what inspires you? Say that again. <laughs> what, okay, I won't say the name again, but what inspires you? What inspires me? Oh, yeah. what? I thought yeah. the, first part of the question, I was like, aesthetics, what? Um, what inspires me? Um, film, I'm massively inspired by film. I think when I'm writing, I don't know, I, I, it sounds like you do too. I think, I, I, I think quite cinematically about it. Um, you know, it's like I can see it on a screen in front of me. Um, so kind of old noir and um, Hitchcocks and um, all the kind of brilliantly awful some of the murder mysteries, um, uh, all sorts of things inspire me. How about you? Um, 
if ever I'm stuck, which happens quite a lot, I just pick up a book and start yeah. reading. Um, yeah. And I'll kind of grab anything, you know, because I'm always in the library, so I'll just grab anything at all and just start reading. And, you know, you'll read like a beautiful paragraph or something. And I just, you know, it makes me want to go and sit down and, and get on with it and make it better. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, and I think location as well, like places and me. So, yeah, that was very much the case with the hunting party and the guests were very much inspired by a place. You know, they sort of grew out of out of a location. Yeah. So um, I'm going to switch the comments back on. You know that question mark at the bottom? Can you see that? No. I think, okay. that's... No, I think that's just on my screen. And why do hearts keep appearing on the sign? People oh. like it, I think. Really? That's good. <laughs> I'm so lame at Instagram. I really am. I'm going to have to get it. Although my brother's got it and I looked at is it? No, he's going to kill me. But um, <laughs> it's just pictures of him kind of pouting and squinting. Oh, <laughs> <really>? <laughs> I know. So I don't want any part of that. Um, right, turning on commenting. Oh. I can't see anything. Right. Hello. <laughs> right, I can scroll through them, I think. Oh, I can go back. I'm looking for the mean ones. Isabel Broom, hi. Oh, people are saying really nice things. I know. <laughs> I watched the book, finished it a couple of weeks ago. Thanks for a brilliant interview. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> Rich. No one's been mean. We're going to see a really mean one in a minute. I know. Um, waiting. I feel like someone should just put... <laughs> yeah. Look how pale he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm not agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he okay? Yeah. Love you both. <laughs> oh, love you too, Frankie. Oh. Oh, I'm like this. I so, know. So do we want people to ask questions? Ask us questions. <laughs> Oh, nice, nice. Okay, question. I'm just going to leave them on. We'll just let yeah. them roll. And I will um, find, yeah, I've got about a million questions to ask you, but we're not going to get <laughs> anywhere near <laughs> all of them. Um, yeah, so what do your family think of the books? Do you ever find it difficult, you know, when you know that a family member, like a parent or something? Yeah, I mean, as you know, like there are some scenes in the guest list and the hunting party that are a little bit like they're not quite PG. Um, so yeah, there are those moments where I think, oh, I would really like to give my parents and my parents-in-law adapted copy of the book in which like all the dodgy scenes are, are sort of scrubbed out. But I think they've got quite strong stomachs for it. I'm sure they cringe when they're reading it, but, um, but no, you just try not to think about it too much. Do you, do you feel the same? Do you feel it? Yeah, I, yeah, my dad's kind of collects all the, the foreign editions of my books and like, he's like my biggest fan, but I never oh. ask if he's actually read them because I don't really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed he'd tell me. Okay, so we've got some questions. Okay. Joel via Lorenus. Um, I sent questions on Walter. Stone. Oh yeah, hang on. Um, how do you disassemble the puzzle pieces coherently so both the characters and the readers can piece them together? I think it says. Wow, you go first on that one. I'm gonna let you answer that one first. Well, I tried it. I did try it with Tall Oaks. You know, when I said about, I just took it to bits, character by character, and um, and I, that was a good way of spotting who was underwritten as well. Because yeah. I, I, you know, like with the word count and things like that, I had massively underwritten one of the characters and I didn't really realise it because, you know, when you get too close to it and you can't see what you're doing, kind of, which I happens all the time and you need an editor to help you. Yeah, so that, I would, if I was going to do kind of multiple narratives again, which I, I might, but I find it tough, um, I would probably do it again. Yeah, that yeah. way, but I'd be better track of it. Interesting. I mean, I, I think, God, it sounds like I'm plugging a bit, uh, like I'm going to get commission or something, but um, there's this brilliant bit of software. Do you use it, Scrivener? Um, I've never used it. I've heard about it, but I have enough trouble with Word and Instagram, obviously. <laughs> Word is so, so what I found with Word is that because I'm so disorganised, I would just end up, because by, by the time you've got like the finished book, you've got like maybe 100,000 words that you're scrolling through. And I find that so hard. And I would end up like literally copying and pasting the same paragraphs so things repeated and it was just really easy. so scrivener you can sort of um divide it all into scenes which is which i found so helpful and then you know for me that's a really useful way of yeah just seeing which characters are having less screen time i've literally got their names there and their scenes um so good 
it is always that thing of like how much of you because you've got everything in your head you know your characters probably so well but how much have you actually put on the page I think that's always the difficult that's always the balance for me as a, as a writer okay so Grace Liddell says what is your favorite book that's a tough one that's a really tough one so tough I mean <laughs> I think we're both quite big readers so yeah um I I love The Road by Cormac McCarthy I love all of Jane Harper's books. I love John Hart's books, Dennis Lehane. I could never choose one. No. Um, I've probably read The Road more than any other. And because it does read differently every single time. And that's, and that's really interesting because I think um, you can really see that there's, there's such a wonderful kind of comparison to make, be made with your books, I think. They've got that kind of The Road feel to them, personally, I think. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't say that very eloquently, but it was. Magic. We did. We did. It really got me. <laughs> in the heart. Um, what are you going to choose for your favourite book? Oh, so difficult. I mean, what genre? I think that's the thing. Like, I write thrillers, um, uh, but I wrote historicals before, and um, you know, I don't really think in terms of genre. I just think in terms of a really good book. Um, well, maybe you should choose your favourite of your books. Can you do that? Are okay. you able? I mean, it's like choosing between children, isn't it? I well, can easily do that, yeah. Because my <laughs> the baby, I love the baby. The boys are a nightmare. Yes, <laughs> so it isn't. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I gosh, uh, probably the, I'll say the guest list because it's the most recent one. But I actually I had good answer. Such a fun writing experience writing this book. I think that's part of it. Like just going to this wedding and just having so much fun, like making it really messy and kind of developing these characters it was just a it was a real ride so I did really enjoy writing it um, so and why are you in Brussels that's another question um because um so my husband works here so we are we're we're here at the moment um yeah for two years and it's a really interesting city actually I kind of thought oh boring EU EU and business but actually um it, it's a fascinating place I'm enjoying getting to know it Excellent. So um, I'm trying to do these. There's a lot of them. Um, Bookish Girl, what's your favourite thriller, mystery TV series or film? Wow, mystery series. So I when, when we were talking about favourite books, um, I was thinking of the Kate Atkinson, Jackson Brady series, um, okay. which I absolutely love. Um, and I think one of the things I love about Kate Atkinson doing crime fiction is that, and, and actually uh, your books as well, is that they absolutely refute the idea that crime writing is plot at the expense of character. Yeah. So character driven. It's just wonderful. She's so kind of compassionate towards her characters. Um, and they're so quirky and funny. Um, and I think the TV series is brilliant as well. I'm sort of slightly obsessed with Jason Isaacs as Jackson Brody. <laughs> so that's sort of two in one. Um, what's, what's your favorite? I don't know if it counts as a thriller or mystery, but I loved The Sopranos. It was like, oh. for me, it was like the best TV show ever made. Yeah. And um, I've been re-watching it. It's been on late um, every night. And I just, I'd forgotten just how good it is. I really, really love it. And um, you know, the film Seven, I watched that again, not that long. Oh, God, that's so good. That's a good rewatch. I'm going to rewatch that. Um, I actually watched The Sopranos. So like okay. I'm embarrassed to say, so that will go straight on my list. Uh, yeah. well, for a while um the wire i absolutely i did love the wire yeah. i'm like yeah, ready for a rewatch of the whole thing i think now because it's been it's been yeah yeah god i really love that like do like dickensian that kind of scope you know this yeah. whole city and all these different sort of um parts of the city like the politics and the journal like how it all comes to it. it's just hello Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. The audio went funny then. Okay, there's um I think that's about it. It's it's called cool to pass now. And um I'm gonna switch the comments off again and say thank you. That was amazing. And um good luck with the baby and the book. And yeah. And um thanks to everyone for watching and thanks for Waterstones for trusting me. Um I'm gonna stay on here for about two hours just plugging my books now. Do it! You've got it! Oh, wait, they'll shut me down. They will shut me down. But I have to say, um, We Begin at the End is just 
it's just a phenomenal piece of writing. I'm plugging it for you. Thank it's you. Cool. Thank um, you. And it's sort of it's heartbreaking as well. And it's just, it's like, it's everything I love about writing in general, but also crime writing. Um, so thank you for writing it. <laughs> and thank you for writing the guest list, which is amazing. Um, I said before that I work in the library, everyone borrows it. It's constantly, it's one of the hot picks. So it gets its own um, stand right behind the stand I built with my books. <laughs> everyone takes it and they really and everyone loves it it's like universally loved even amongst the staff everyone has read it and they pass it around and everyone talks about how amazing it is and they play games like trying to guess who oh thank who, you okay you have to stop now because i'm just like i'm just sweating with embarrassment okay right um so i have to i have to do something i have to i have to press end and then i have to share to I'm going to mess this up and just lose this forever. So if anyone watched this live, you're the lucky ones. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. I'll speak to you soon.